You know, and I was wondering your question, could if Chris Mr. Be... Ellsberg could touch upon how, how your role historically as a whistleblower seems to relate to this case, and um, perhaps Alexa too, given that you have spoken at length with groups like WikiLeaks and have interviewed them as a journalist, and wh whether those implications are... No, you'd rather not? Just Daniel then. Well, reading... Wait, wait. I, turn me, uh, reading uh, Judge Forrest's opinion last night, which is well worth doing. I didn't read every word. I went through every word. There were 112 pages and read a lot of it quite, quite uh, carefully because it was fascinating. And one thing that struck me very much was here is somebody actually taking the Constitution seriously and the rights seriously as though they weren't just a piece of paper but were really important to interpret and preserve. And it struck me that if, John, if Judge Forrest had been a judge, and there have only been a couple so far, who had addressed the law on which I was prosecuted, the so-called Espionage Act, 18 U.S.C. 793, paragraphs D and E, corresponding to this section. I can roll that off trippingly now <coughs> after 40 years. And um, uh, that she would almost certainly, I would think, find that unconstitutional and facially unconstitutional. Uh, and again, the same issues arise. Uh, a breadth and vagueness in this case. Uh, the, the word classified isn't used in that, by the way. They talk about information relating to the national defense, which is obviously as broad as you want to make it um, altogether. For practical purposes, they've tended to apply it to classified information. But that, in turn, is in a vastly inflated, enormous amount of discourse that's covered by this and not appropriate. Uh, the way that act is written, it can apply just as well as me, Bradley Manning, uh, and all cases in which it's been invoked here. It can apply exactly as well to a reader or to an editor or to a, to a journalist. No distinction is made. It says if you receive classified, it doesn't say classified, information relating to the national defense and do not return it to the proper authorities. For example, your New York Times said we have, we cannot tell you the source of this because it's classified and you're looking at it, you've been told it's classified. If you don't return that paper to the proper authorities, who would be, you know, exactly who, who in this house, you are, that's the second, you're not only possessing it, you are delivering it to someone not authorized to receive it any more than you were. Well, words like that mean that literally, as, if, as far as the words are concerned, everybody here who reads a classified document in the New York Times, and certainly the journalists, can be, uh, could be prosecuted under that. And obviously a, a breadth aspect there and in vagueness that's enormous. Well, that's never gone to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has never ruled on that. That law should be found unconstitutional. I'm saying uh, Bowen has now brought actually seven uh, indictments usually say six, but there was a quiet one just a couple months ago. <clears throat> and uh, of course, they're working on Assange. Uh, if any of those are con lead to convictions and are s sent to the Supreme Court, and in the past, three people out of these seven or so have pled guilty, whether they should have or not, uh, very questionable. But to get out of the case, they pled guilty. There's been no, uh, except for Franklin uh, Morrison, Sam Loring Morrison. He was uh, judged by a jury. He's the only one who's been judged. That case did not go to the Supreme Court. The effect of it was denied. The effect was the Supreme Court has never ruled on whether it is, in fact, criminal to release to an unauthorized person, that is a cleared person that doesn't have a clearance at the moment, among other things, any information they've protected, any classified information, anybody you're holding in your hands. Now, they can say... We haven't applied it to you. You know, don't worry about it. Trust us. Isn't that exactly the, the same thing that's arising in oh, this case? They're saying we're choir boys. We don't want to affect journalists. Yet then they'll say independent journalists have nothing to fear. But who judges who's independent? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the great problem. There's no such thing as independent speech. So if in the case of uh, 18 U.S.C., if they turn it on Assange, there's a case where he could, uh, a lot of journalists, maybe even Bill Keller, will say, well, he's not really a journalist. We don't have to worry yet. We can't be in solidarity. Uh, we don't trust this guy. He's not a real journalist. That's why he offers them a very good target, a gray area. If Assange were indicted and evicted, he's doing exactly the same function as the New York Times or the Post. There's no real distinction, except that 
the Post and the Times may not notice it. And uh, in which case, they'd be going after others as well. Same here. Uh, when they asked me, for instance, is your, the lawyer asked me, is your speech, public speech, going to be chilled by this act since you're supporting WikiLeaks? Now, WikiLeaks and, and Manning, have, uh, Manning specifically, has been uh, charged with aiding the enemy. That sounds very much like a group associated, as though he's associated with an enemy group, isn't it, to say that? Well, you know, their general view is, well, if the world learns of some of our embarrassing uh, dilemmas, like shooting innocent people in, in different countries, you know, that's aiding the enemy because the enemy, you know, is more emboldened to keep fighting. Well, that's a very dis disconnected yeah. concept. But once you take that standard, nothing is sacred. Every journalist yeah. in the country. So, okay, so he were, I'm aiding an enemy, I'm aiding WikiLeaks, then they come after me and I say, well, is it gonna stop me from, from talking in favor of Manly? My first thought was no. The lawyer then said, well, sorry then, you're n you don't have standing because if you're not hurt by this, if you're not affected by it, yes. uh, you don't have standing. Yeah, my I mean, sec my sorry, second, what's it? Sorry, go ahead. My second thought was, wait a minute though, I don't mind saying what I say in public. Everybody knows what I've said, they can judge it for themselves. I might be found guilty, but at least the public would know what I'd said and what I hadn't said, and they could make their own judgment. Since NSA and FBI are listening and recording to every word I say on the phone and in text and in email, they all have that. Uh, I don't like the thought that they can put me in military custody uh, uh, without, even being, without the public even knowing what the context was that I said. Maybe they wouldn't even have to tell me. I don't know, you can tell me. They said, You've, we've heard you say this, that to us is support. Uh, they might or might not tell me. It's classified. Uh, they can't tell me. But in any case, they can, uh, they can come out and uh, get me for talking to these people with, uh, without <coughs> it being public what it is I've actually said or what are the context. So it seems to me there are people right in this room that I would phone a lot, literally, that I would phone a lot more than I, than I am if I could be sure, A, that they're not listening to me, which is impossible, and second, that they're not gonna use it against me to put me in military detention. That I'm not anxious to do. And, no. I, and I'm, I'm curious to hear from the, you know, the other named plaintiffs. Alexa, have you not had conversations with people? Have you uh, curbed your speech in public forums? I mean, you're, you're on this stage right now. Uh, you know, has the NDAA, prevented you from speaking out in any way? Well, uh, this is actually uh, spelled out in my affidavit and in my testimony. <clears throat> I'm not a coward, um, uh, but uh, I am a normal nobody. Uh, and I say that, you know, uh, quite comfortably. Um, I, I don't have the capacity of uh, a, a large bank account and a team of lawyers to protect me uh, from uh, the U.S. government prosecution, so I've held back uh, two articles. Uh, related to the war on terror um, because of the NDAA. We're a team of lawyers, what do you mean? Well, yeah, but... <laughs> 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 um, you guys need representation all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and sort of, sort of adding to that, um, y how, how perhaps, and maybe this is one for, for Tangerine, or really any of, of the people on stage, um, it's been commented that, that uh, the focus of this case, um, and for relevant reasons already explained, has largely been, been journalists and, and protected speech in that space. But as you mentioned before, Mr. Hedges, um, your, your fear, based on the speed with which the Obama attorneys tried to get the got the injunction stayed, was the assumption that, that perhaps dual nationality individuals were already in indefinite detention. Um, perhaps someone could touch upon why this, this lawsuit hasn't brought in more everyday people who are not necessarily, you know, uh, named white well, journalists. Okay, let me, I think Alexa should explain the example mm -hmm. of the uh, Stafford dump. Because what they are doing is attempting to take legitimate forms of dissent and great journalism, uh, it might surprise Bill Keller, is a form of dissent. Um, it challenges assumptions and official narratives and do exactly what they did in the war against communism. Link as they <coughs> turned I.F. Stone into a pariah. Uh, and uh, they tar you with terror. And this is precisely, it came up and was extremely important in the case, I'll let Alexa spell it out, uh, where this, we saw this link already happening, but she will explain it. 
I had been covering um, the revolutions across uh, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, in particular Bahrain. I mean, I had a very, very popular live blog on Bahrain because uh, I, I think it was popular, uh, not because it was like a masterwork blog, but because nobody was covering what was going on in Bahrain. Um, and I had been covering the WikiLeaks release of Guantanamo cables. The reason why I shook my head is I haven't interviewed WikiLeaks. I, I just wanted to clarify that. I, um, yeah, I've, sorry, st I've studied the US investigation. I just want right. to uh, make sure that's clear. Um, so I had been covering the releases, and I have you know, conducted hundreds of hours of interviews with detainees, former detainees, or prison guards. Some of it's published, some of it isn't. And so when, you know, when, when, when I started U.S. Day of Rage at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, you know, in March, I had no idea it was going to take off. And it took off. And so then it was like basically getting in the car, and the car st like starts speeding. Well, um, what ended up happening was, uh, and it, because of my work as a journalist covering the war on terror, uh, private security contractors started to try to link this group. And we went viral in Egypt, and we went viral in Bahrain, because people knew me as a journalist. They didn't necessarily know that I was behind US Day of Rage, but I mean, I would tweet it from my personal uh, feed, and then it would, and, and it went, I mean, people went crazy in solidarity. I mean, we had people in Egypt creating crowdsourcing maps to help US Day of Rage and other groups and Occupy Wall Street to, to, for September 17th. Um, so there, there's a direct correlation. I mean, what ended up happening, I mean, you can sort of see the evolution of contractors. Um, I was contacted by a federal agent who knows my character and knows that I'm not a said that he had seen uh, documents relating to this business meeting at work. Uh, of my supervisor on this project, who was a former interrogator, said, I people ask you in the government by name, um, document out saying that you know, this organization is linked to cyber terrorists. So there was a you know, WikiLeaks release of the Stratford cables. You can see a private security contractor emailing um, Fred Burton, who was their counterterrorism uh, uh, counter expert, so to quote unquote. Uh, asking specifically to link this group to Al Qaeda, so that's the kind of fabric that I'm operating in. And you know, we we, we talk about the sort of legal parameters of, uh, you know, th this particular litigation or executive power. Executive power is extrajudicial. Period. That's its nature. That's why our founders needed the check of Congress and the judicial branch. And what's happening is I feel like the public is in this kind of shock and awe. Like, oh my god, you, what do you mean the extrajudicial you know, application of power? Like, you know, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. I mean, that's the nature of the beast that we need because we do have to protect ourselves from, uh, theoretically, I mean, from like wars and such. And it's very hard to fight a war by bureaucracy. Um, you need an executive. Uh, and at the same time, to check that power. So. Uh, that's it. Um, so I'm just quickly going to um, ask Tangerine about, about the kind of makeup of the panel, because it, and then we're going to um, get to questions very quickly, and Matt's going to have one more question. Just because um, I think there's an assumption with a, a lot of these um, civil liberties uh, it, uh, assumed infringements or alleged infringements, that it's not really the white journalists who are going to get hit first. Um, so I was wondering if it's you a, could address that. It's a really legitimate question, and um, it's a two-part answer for me. There's process and strategy. On the process end, we were working at a, a thousand miles per hour. I had six weeks to gather people together that I felt would make a good case for this and have standing. I reached out to who I knew and who responded, and that was Dan Ellsberg and Noam Chomsky, as far as who I didn't know yet. Um, so there's that, and by no means did I deliberately make this all white or uh, <coughs> I never would have gone down that road deliberately. Um, strategy, though, and this speaks to the finer points, I think, how do you be strategic about the gray area in the war on terror? And the gray area is ever evolving, ever um, expanding. Um, how do we tease out the very real erosions in this really distorted national security milieu and the really distorted national security narrative? And that narrative dominates. It dominates in our courts. It dominates in Congress. It, it dominates across the spectrum. So how do, you, how do you take that where you have a, a lawsuit which is highly compartmentalized, where you're shoved into these tiny parameters, and how do you see the forest for the trees? Um, I, tr I brought these people together 
because I wanted judges to see the forest for the trees because together, all of us, and far more people than are sitting here, tell the story. We all tell the story of what's happening. And I somehow wanted to overcome the um, constraints, the uh, conflicting imperatives between activism and using the, using the rule of law to restore the rule of law. Um, the last piece of that, though, because it's really important, um, material support and substantial support. And I'm sorry we don't have more time because our lawyers would be much better to speak to this. But um, Andy Stepanian, who's done so much work for us, and thank you so much, Andy. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't go into his case, but he was, um, he's gone through a lot in his life. And um, he has a, his heart is you know, really dedicated to deal, fighting material support because the material support laws are so gray themselves. And he knows many innocent people who have been nailed on material support. So um, I, what I wanted to do strategy-wise was what is most politically feasible, legally feasible, and socially feasible. Is that fair or right or perfect? It's not perfect, it's not ideal, but what battle can we win first? And I just really hope we win this one. <laughs>